I'm David DeCosmo. Welcome to Preview, our Electric City Television's public access station. Uh, our program is our public affairs weekly program. And uh, this week we're going to be previewing an exciting uh, documentary that will soon be shown in uh, selective spots throughout our area. And it's a documentary about an event which literally changed lives, which changed the uh, the work climate throughout northeastern Pennsylvania. It is a documentary on the Knox Mine disaster. And joining us today are two of the people very involved with the uh, production of this documentary. We have Al Broca, who along with his brother are actually sort of doing the, uh, the uh, video work, as it were. Mm -hmm. And also with us is uh, uh, Bob Wolanski, who is the historian uh, with regard to this. Uh, you know, Al, well, the first thing I'm thinking about is mm -hmm. this happened so long ago. Uh, it must be a little difficult to deal with it from a video point of view. Well, not necessarily because th this day and age, you could, you're able to dig back using the internet and find all the old photos and articles and everything to do with history of the day, things that were archived. And, and, and so I, I guess think, so I, it's e easier than ever just to get on the computer and type <laughs> some keywords in and then everything comes up. And I guess some of the video, because we, we talked before we went on mm -hmm. the air about uh, uh, my former place of employment, Channel 22, mm -hmm. and Jack Scanella, the uh, chief photographer there who did some of the yeah. uh, actual film yeah. footage of the disaster and its, and its environs. Yeah. Um, before we get into the, the total importance and the history of this, mm -hmm. We're talking about a documentary that's uh, in the works right now, mm -hmm. and it's going to be shown, as I said, at various locations. Mm -hmm. uh, the first we want to talk about, I believe, is at College Misericordia in Luzerne County. Yes. Uh, what is the schedule there? January 31st at 7 p.m. at the Lemon Theater at College of Misericordia in Dallas, Pennsylvania. Um, we'll be screening that for, uh, op it's open to the public, and, but we're also doing a screening for the students on the 28th. Ah, good. Because it's a historical, um, local, it's local history, and we feel that the students need to know, and it, they should uh, watch the film as sure. well. Sure, sure. And you're talking to, you will be talking to college students who have mm -hmm. no practical uh, mm -hmm. recollection of what happened. So, Bob, mm -hmm. I turn to you at that point. Mm -hmm. um, let's set the stage. Uh, the Knox Mine was basically an underground coal mine, basically in the greater Pittston area. And miners were in there doing their regular daily chores, which was, you know, chopping away at the anthracite coal and loading it into cars, and the cars get hauled out. What happened? Well, can I just make um, one comment about the, um, it's really Misericordia University. Oh, yes, yes. You can tell that we're local folks because we <laughs> call it College Misericordia, and, and I've done that too. Hmm. So we want to give them their proper Well, that, that's the age, status. Old, the age old name. So yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, university It's now. the same mm -hmm. place, Misericordia uh, University. But I get back to my question. What happened in that What happened at Knox? <laughs> yeah, well, um, <clears throat> this was um, a, a very active coal mine. Um, owned by some local folks of quite nefarious, dubious character. And they were mining uh, in the Port Griffith area, um, Greater Pittston. Right. Um, it's called Port Griffith because it was a port on the North Branch Canal uh -huh. at one time. Recall, at one time, back in the 19th century, the coal left this area via canal going south. And if you look at the railroad tracks that go under the 8th Street Bridge and up into Port Griffith and up into Pittston, I mean, those railroad tracks, that was the canal bed. So originally, you hauled that coal out by, by barges, by That's boats, right. That's right. until the railroads came That's into prominence right. and took over that, uh, that job. That's right. We had a whole series of canals in Pennsylvania and elsewhere. Of course, maybe the most famous canal was not in Pennsylvania, the Erie Canal. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, still in existence, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, at Knox in Port Griffith, uh, the men had been mining um, under the river in an illegal place. They were supposed to have at least 35 feet of rock cover over their mining chamber. 50 feet was 
the state preferred level, but it was never really written into law, Dave. It was, it was more of a standard that, that companies honored, and the state would allow them to go down the 35 feet. But if you were under the river, which was legal, you could mine under a river, but you, you had to do boreholes. You had to do surface boreholes in the river from a barge. And um, the Knox Coal Company uh, didn't do their due diligence and make sure that there were the proper bore, boreholes. There were old boreholes, which showed sufficient cover on one hand. Um, uh, and, on, and then the nearest borehole uh, to that had only 19 inches of, of rock cover. So you're in a tunnel. Above you is rock, gravel, perhaps coal, but that, that ceiling above you is only 19? Well, not exactly. They had, they had um, over 35 feet in one borehole and, and 150 uh, uh, yards away, 75 yards away was another borehole that, that, uh, that, uh, that someone else had done, not Knox. The Pennsylvania Coal Company did that. And that showed 19 inches. And so they thought they were in the middle between these two boreholes. So they, they used so-called interpolation, which is a nonsense word. It's not an engineering word. It's a guess. It's a guess. It's a guess. To figure, well, between 19 and, and over 35, maybe we have 20 feet. We can probably pull this off. Well, they didn't because they all had no more than about, it's, people debate how much rock cover they had, but it was no more than about five or six feet. The river swelled on January 19th, 20, 21. It was a thaw. The weight of the water would not, um, it was too much for the rock cover. For, for, for the the rock cover. Mm -hmm. In comes the river. And it, it kills 12 men and ends deep mining, certainly in the greater Pittston area. But eventually that water went south. And um, we had mining in the Wyoming Valley until the, until the mid-70s, uh, thanks to a lot of pumping and thanks to the mine being up away from the actual valley well, I, floor. I, I think this would, what's confusing people like myself who are not miners, and, and uh, you say to yourself, well, I've got, I've got a series of tunnels in that area, and the river comes through, and it, it's a disaster, and it, it floods that whole area. But why does that affect the mines yeah. further down near Wilkesbury? Why does that affi uh, affect the mines down near Natticoke? Well, a very, oh, yeah. a very logical question. question. Go ahead. Yeah. The logical question is, you're right, why would it affect the surrounding mines? So uh, the rulings were that they had to have barriers. Each mine, different mine, the Knox and so on and so forth, had mm -hmm. to have a barrier. But the barriers were made of rich coal. And throughout the years, the miners and the owners were skimming the pillars and the barriers to get the coal. So they were taking out what should have been protection. Yes. Because the protection was partially coal. Yes. They were supposed to leave. Removing that to thick walls. Gain the revenue. And the walls got thinner and thinner and thinner. So then here comes along the disaster. The Knox fills up with water and the pressure pushes through to the next mine and so on and so forth. So what we get is a chain reaction of, of flooding of an entire valley. Do you have any idea, Bob, how many people were working in the anthracite coal fields, this in our immediate Wyoming Valley yeah. type area, at just before that river broke? Yeah, through? it was over six thousand. Over six thousand yeah. jobs. Yeah. Now, and uh, afterwards? Um, well, it went down to you know uh, maybe uh, maybe a thousand, because recall that Nanticoke and and and, and Glen Alden and and those areas down there they continued for a while through pumping. So they still had water. They had water. Well, you always have water in a mine, David. Okay. Constant water because water will always, rain water will always go down. And the state had actually, in the, in the 1950s, Daniel J. Flood was our representative, and Daniel J. Flood took care of many things around here through Washington. And, and he had the, he had the, the, the federal government uh, buy pumps, buy pumps through federal, with, using federal money, big mine, massive mine pumps placed in numerous mines, mm -hmm. but the companies had to pay for the installations and the maintenance. But Knox overwhelmed those pumps. Now, I want to say one thing about that, however. It overwhelmed them temporarily, but then the state of Pennsylvania put in many more pumps and pumped out as over 10 billion gallons, which is what went in at Knox. It pumped out 10 billion gallons, wow. put them, put, sent that water downstream. Looking for, and the men went in to those chambers looking for bodies, never found those 12 bodies. They're still out there somewhere. That's, that's their graveyard. It's been very tough on the families. 
And they were also, they also pumped the water out because they sealed the breach with concrete ah. in, a, in a very ingenious uh, um, operation where they dammed the river and pumped the water out of the dam and then the boreholes in uh, underground and pumped in, you know, I don't know how many cubic yards of concrete, but many to seal it. But it was really more symbolic yeah. than anything. Yeah. Now, now, interestingly enough, we've we touched on uh, very basically, uh, and again, a lot before we went on the air, about the fact that during the time of the actual emergency, mm -hmm. there was a huge whirlpool in the Susquehanna River yes. as that water went into the mine. And one of the methods used to attempt to seal up that hole mm -hmm. was to divert railroad cars mm -hmm. and actually roll those cars right into the whirlpool mm -hmm. and down into the hole. And some of the pictures of that were photographed by the late Jack Scanella, who was a chief photographer at WDAU, later WYOU-TV. Now, you've got that footage, don't you? Of course, yeah. Yeah, well, the one thing that stands out with the Knox is the iconic whirlpool. People always think, wow, they, when they hear about it, they say, this, this whirlpool opened up in the river. And so when a lot of people came down, Jack, one of them, he came down from, I think he said he was, when, I, when me and Dave sat down and interviewed him in his home, he told us a little bit about, uh, you know, all about the story, and it's in the film as well. But he said he was in Mount Pocono, and he got the, he heard on the radio that the Knox had broke, and that the, the river was breached, the Susquehanna. And so he drove down from the Poconos, and he went right to the scene where it was uh, chaos has had ensued. People were coming down just to see what was going on. And he said that he came down there and he saw the whirlpool, and it was it was just a force of nature, unheard of. Imagine just huge railroad cars yeah. disappearing into this vortex going down in. And I have to tell you a personal story mm -hmm. uh, that I had a, a gentleman that used to work around our housing area who was originally a miner. And uh, years back, during uh, basically a drought-type situation, mm -hmm. he had an occasion to take a mining official mm -hmm. down into uh, one of the tunnels that I, begin, I think it began in the Plains Township area. And I don't know what the reason for this uh, exploration was, but during the exploration they found mm -hmm. in this tunnel mm -hmm. a crumbled-up railroad gondola. So... I can imagine seeing that underground and realizing why it was there and saying to myself, why am I here at, at, at this particular place at this particular time? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Bob, again, this was devastating to the anthracite mining industry. And when we think about the industry, I guess we normally think about uh, the miners, but mm -hmm. think of all the supportive industries that uh, actually literally supported the miners, the miners' families and things that would have suffered because of this loss as well. Oh, it was immense. I mean, the, the repercussions from um, not just hauling the coal, which my family did out of Swearville, but, um, you know, you have less income, so you're buying f fewer groceries and you're buying fewer clothes and yeah. you're not going to buy a new car so as, as soon as, as you would other, otherwise have done. So the repercussions were, were wide and vast. But you mentioned Plains Township. That coal, as it went south, first hit the number 14 in, uh, in, in, uh, in Jenkins Township, which was one of the Pennsylvania Coal Company uh, uh, collieries. And then it went to the Henry and Prospect of the Lehigh Valley Coal Company in Plains Township. Ah. And so that, that so shows so you- there's your interconnection. That shows you how far yeah. uh, that would have gone. But as Al, Al mentioned, um, there was a survey done by the Pennsylvania Coal Company and, and, uh, of their own mines, and they found that the, ba the barriers, 100 feet solid coal between mining company operations, 100 feet of solid coal, as Al mentioned, was supposed to prevent a flood or an explosion and a fi or a fire from going from this operation to that operation. The barriers had been pillaged. They had been pillaged by the miners. With, with, with the blessings of the companies, because this was very easy coal and things were getting, getting wild around here yeah. in, in the 50s. And coal was a very valuable commodity. I mean, it was uh, valuable. most of us in this area grew up with coal-fired furnaces uh, sure. before the cost of uh, oil and gas sure. kind of changed things. We're talking about the, uh, the documentary on the Knox Mine disaster, 
And uh, there'll be a series of premieres. And again, the first one we're mentioning mm -hmm. will be at the University of Misericordia. Yes. And the date again on that, Al, is... is the 31st um, of January. Okay. And there will be subsequent uh, screenings, so you want to watch. Uh, and by the way, will there be a place where people can check to see where it's going to be shown as things change, as you Definitely. cut more screenings? Yes, we have. Where, where can we they have, check We in? have a website, uh, www.knoxmindisaster.com. And then also we're on Facebook and a lot, it's been, Facebook has really been a blessing for the film because um, a lot of people get, have gotten on, a lot of families have gotten on Facebook and have been able to communicate with us and see the progress of the film. And we've actually gotten a lot of um, great grandkids and grandkids of the minors that were in the disaster and then would say that, hey, that's my grandfather. And I, you know, and, and, and they would open up and, and, and chime in. And so um, <laughs> that, that has been one of the most tremendous things. It's really through, touched, through the, the, touched the hearts. Uh, through the years, I through, was able to interview on, on various anniversaries of yeah. Mr. Stella. I believe it was Joe Stella, mm -hmm. who was one of those who led some of the survivors <clears throat> yeah. out of the mine. And what a, what a gentleman he was. And, and yeah. to hear his recollection of what happened. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is very important to touch on, and I, I, I guess we'll have to see whether mm -hmm. you get into this in the documentary, mm -hmm. is that when we think about the Knox Mine disaster, those that remember it, remember that whirlpool and remember mm -hmm. all that activity and remember Joe Stella coming out with his group that he led out of a, an air shaft to, yeah. uh, to safety. Um, we don't always remember the mm -hmm. aftermath, and I don't mean mm -hmm. the impact on the coal industry. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the legal aspect. So, yes. Bob, uh, this didn't end with, with this. Uh, what happened right afterwards? Well, the documentary does, <clears throat> does deal with this. In fact, one of the beauties of the documentary is that, I think it was WYOU, mm -hmm. gave Al and Dave Bracca, mm -hmm. who, by the way, are cousins, Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, and uh, and uh, gave them the footage of the of the testimonies done by the, the state investigations and some in the court cases. And Dave and Al hauled these out to California, mm. to the University of Southern California, which is mm. one of the top film schools in the country. And USC agreed to digitize all these. How many reels? It was uh, dozens, 30 reels, 30 plus reels. Priceless history. Priceless history. Yes. It could have been lost very easily. It could have been lost. I think they rescued it. It was in the basement of yeah. WIOU and mm -hmm. yeah. another flood in the Wyoming Valley could yeah. have wiped them out. Yeah. But they, they did that. So they were able to, this video, this documentary has excellent video live, well, li filmed live right. coverage. I think Jack Scanella also filmed yes, some of that yes, at the did. courthouse um, uh, of, of different, Testimony, including the owners. There were four owners. Louis Fabrizio, um, John Chandra, who, who actually died in 1949, and, it, and the shares went to his wife, Josephine Chandra of Pittston. August J. Lippi, who happened to be the president of the local mine workers union, and it was, of course, totally illegal to be an owner of a coal company and, yet and be a union, union man, but he was, he was an owner on the QT. And Robert Dougherty of Hazleton, who was the superintendent and general manager of the Knox Coal Company. There were other officers, but they were the four main stockholders. <clears throat> and after the flood, um, caused by the, uh, the underground flood caused by the Knox mine disaster, um, there were a series of, there were five different investigations by the federal and state governments, different branches. The FBI was involved because if you remember, the famous Appalachian mine, uh, Appalachian crime summit took place in 1957 in Appalachian, New York. That was the one supposedly uh, arranged by uh, uh, Russell Buffalino. Well, Russell Buffalino and his right-hand man, Joseph Barbera, yes. was at Barbera's estate, okay? Buffalino had no mine holdings that, that we know of, or either did Barbera, but they convened it in New York State, and of course it was, it was raided by the, by the police, 57. And so the FBI are on their, are on their you know, mark looking for organized crime influence in various parts of the country, and they established an office in New York just for organized crime. And the um, original owner of the Knox Gold Company, John Chandra of Pittston, was alleged to have been the top boss before Barbera uh -huh. and after one Santo Volpe of Pittston, who founded organized crime 
in Pittston. This is, you know, this is all hitting so close to home right now with uh, uh, the 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 uh, publication of they say you paint houses. I heard mm -hmm. you paint houses. Uh, the Quiet Dawn, which does deal with uh, with Buffalino, and, and of course the recent uh, Netflix uh, release of The Irishman, mm -hmm. which was based on yeah. I heard you paint houses. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> These are all connected. So, oh, yeah. so this is another arm of that. And, and, that and they also figure into the garment industry, which, ah, yes. yeah, which very is much so. my other, my yeah, other very, research very interest. Very much so, sure. But so th there were investigations. Chandra's, John Chandra dies in 1949 of natural causes. The Internet mistakenly states that he was, he was murdered and he was not. His wife, Josephine, gets the shares, but she has nothing to do with Knox. So Lippi, Fabrizio, and Daugherty are all tried for various crimes and conspiracy um, uh, to defraud, mining law violations, manslaughter. They were convicted of a lot of them, but on appeal uh, and, and, and on, uh, you know, the statute of limitations, they got off on, on virtually all of them. They were, only, they were sent to jail for income tax evasion, which is how we used to get, you know, those kind of folks so they got back in the, bones, the 50s sure. and 60s. Yeah. Nowadays, we have the RICO law. RICO, R-I-C-O, for racketeering, crime, you know. and you can get them for doing actual organized crime. But back then it had to be income tax. So they all three, and Mrs. Chandra was also convicted of income tax evasion, but she was given a suspended sentence because she really had nothing to do with the company. She just owned the shares. Now, Bob, were these federal charges or state or a combination? The combination. And county. Uh, 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 the DA, Steve Teller, from Luzerne County, uh, tried this. And he, he, he tried... He tried um, uh, two of the defendants, but they were very clever because two of them stayed in Luzerne County and, uh, and, and three of them asked for a change of venue and they went down to Northampton County. Ah. And the guys in Northampton blamed the guys in Luzerne County and the guys in Luzerne County blamed the guys in, down in Northampton County and so they were all acquitted. Wow, wow. Were, were any of the victims' families compensated in any way? In a minor way. <clears throat> it took a long time. And it was, it was relative peanuts uh, of a couple thousand dollars, which might have, might have helped with the burials. But it took, it took you know, quite, a, quite a long time, and not all of them got compensated. Yeah. How much, uh, how much study did you uh, and your cousin have to uh, put into this to, to make this into a documentary? Well, we were in constant uh, communications with Bob because he, you know, he wrote the book about it, and he had done all the homework, and he had been working on it for years. So we always had to contact him just to, just to double check that we were on the right path. But it was definitely a, a, a lot of work over the years. You know, Anything I, that surprised you? Well, it, just how complex this, this was. This, you know, this disaster, it branched out in so many different ways, you know, with, into the court hearings and how people were connected with organized crime. And then also how the, the mining and leasing system was a part. And it just, it just started all to make sense on how something like this disaster occurred because of, because of all these different factors. And it really and, is. And, and you've got to put it together yeah. in, from a, a film, a, you know, a video point of view. Yeah. In, in an order that, that uh, makes sense and tells exactly. that story. And, and, and also make it entertaining because, you know, it's, uh, people, uh, it seems like uh, people always need to, I don't know, uh, be into something. It's, uh, we wanted to give it a little bit more flair. And uh, we, did, we did that with the stories. When we sat down with uh, the miners and they told the stories, we wanted to really highlight the stories. And so we thought about what, what could we do? And then me and my cousin were like, well, what about reenactments? We always see reenactments in movies. And then we went back, we said, you know, those could be very costly. And sometimes they might not come out great. You have to have all the clothes of the time and all the equipment. And we ended up going with um, a hand-drawn, charcoal-animated series uh -huh. that highlights. And you see this in, in the poster, as we'll show later, as we hired an artist. Just hold one up. Yeah, one yeah second, just hold one up. Uh, so th this is a charcoal drawing of one of the stories, of one of the scenes um, of, of what happened that day underground with the mine with the 33 trap miners and it just uh, when you see it in the film uh, it just really brings everything to life and sure. really and Al it. I guess most of the rest of the video mm -hmm. uh, would be historical footage and and interviews yes uh, with uh, yeah with it, folks that were involved that that's uh, 
This, uh, in a sense, this uh, poster tells a lot uh, because it's black and white, and it seems the world was was black and white uh, then. <laughs> yeah. But then, as Bob discovered in his investigation of mm -hmm. uh, of everything that happened, there was a, a lot more uh, strange colors <laughs> behind the scenes there. Yeah. Bob, uh, will coal ever come back in this area? No. Well, keep in mind that it's not totally gone. I mean, there's still, no, there's no. still folks taking coal, as we say, down below. Um, there's still miners. Uh, some of them are not 100% legal, but there's still people taking coal from dog holes. But as a main industry? As a main industry, no. no. It'll, it, it'll always be... <laughs> look, look, at one time in northeastern PA, as, as, late as, as late as the 1920s, we had 150,000 or more anthracite mine workers in this region. That's just the guys digging the coal. Yeah. This is not, caught, not counting the guys hauling it or, or you know, the people selling furnaces, all, all, those, all those ancillary industries. So it was a massive industry. We bring in an industry around here now or a, a service, you know, 500 jobs. Oh, wow, that, that is yeah. just tremendous. What, what an amazing 150,000 sure. uh, anthracite yeah. mine workers. Uh, Al, uh, yeah. time's just about up. One more time, a reminder to the folks who are watching as to where they can get information about these showings. Okay. You can go onto our website, knoxmindisaster.com, or check us out on Facebook at Knox Mind Disaster Documentary, and we'll be up uploading uh, the latest dates. Um, we are going to be doing various screenings um, around the area and then also around in the state. Um, the one to check out is January 31st at uh, College of Misericordia, the University of Misericordia in Dallas, Pennsylvania. And, and Bob, uh, one final thought from you? Yes, uh, this documentary, and there's gonna be a, um, another showing, but it's gonna be shown before this program is aired, is part of Anthracite Mining Heritage Month. Uh -huh. We do this every January. It was triggered by the Knox in 1999 on the 40th anniversary. They debuted this film last year on the 60th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, and then they've revised it slightly. Um, it's it's going to be better than ever. Uh, but we have 17 different programs this year. And where can they get information on those? And, and you get these at, at, at the website of the Anthracite Heritage Foundation. Anthracite Heritage, Heritage Foundation. Foundation. Okay. Dot com, dot org. Mm -hmm. And you'll find the, the full schedule. It was also printed in last Sunday's Citizen's Voice. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. This sounds like a... A great documentary. I'm certainly going to be looking forward to seeing it. So yeah. thank you. I'm David DeCosmo for Electric City Television. Until we see you again next week, here's hoping all your news is good.